as you may be or may not be aware, yesterday our study got cut off. <laughs> and as you know, we were also having many uh, issues with audio. I don't know what was up because there's two separate systems that we are doing these lessons on. There's a Periscope and then there's Pal Talk here. And the same thing was happening on two separate platforms. So obviously we know the enemy was not happy with what with what the Most High was showing us to bring forth yesterday. So um, all that means is that we're going to start from there today and, and, and review that again. So yeah, we got a part one, which is only 25 minutes long. It started and then we uploaded that to YouTube this morning. And then we're going to start again in part two today of uh, Isaiah chapter seven. But before we do that, uh, Isha, let me know when you are in uh, Hangouts, and then when she is there, we we're going to start. Uh, we're going to we're going to have prayer. You are okay. Let's have prayer, and then we'll get into our three scriptures that we get in, in the morning. Thank you, Most High, for your goodness and mercy toward us in waking us up this morning. We pray that your spirit will continue to guide and direct our path in your word today, that your name will be uplifted and honored and glorified as we learn, as we grow, and as we perform your commandments. In the name of the Messiah, how shall we pray? Amen. All right. Our first scripture, as we normally read, is Exodus chapter 31. Exodus chapter 31. Exodus 31. We'll be reading from verse 12 to 18. Exodus chapter 31. From verse 12 to 18. And Yahweh spake unto Moses, saying, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbath ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generation, that ye may know that Ahiah Yahweh doth sanctify you. Ye shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy unto you. Everyone that defileth it shall surely be put to death. For whosoever so doth any work therein, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Six days may work be done, but in the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy to Yahweh. Whosoever doth any work in the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath, to observe the Sabbath throughout their generation for perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days Yahweh made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested. And was refreshed. And he gave unto Moses, when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, tables of stone, written with the finger of the Most High. Exodus chapter 31. Deuteronomy chapter 30 is our next scripture that we read. Deuteronomy chapter 30. Deuteronomy 30, verses 1 through 10. Deuteronomy chapter 30. Verses 1 through 10. These be the words. And it shall come to pass. When all these things are come upon thee. The blessing and the curse. Which I have set before thee. And thou shalt call them to mind. Among all the nations. With Yahweh thy most high have driven thee. And shalt return. Unto Yahweh thy most high. And shall obey. His voice. According to all that I command thee this day. Thou and thy children, with all thy heart, with all thy soul, that then Yahweh thy Most High will turn thy captivity and have compassion upon thee, and will return and gather thee from all the nations where Yahweh thy Most High have scattered thee. If any of them be driven out unto the outmost parts of heaven, from thence will Yahweh thy Most High gather thee, and from thence will he fetch thee. And Yahweh, thy Most High, will bring thee into the land which thy fathers possessed, and thou shalt possess it. And he will do thee good and multiply thee above thy heart. And Yahweh, thy Most High, will circumcise thy heart in the heart of thy seed, 
to love Yahweh, thy most high, with all thy heart and with all thy soul, that thou mayest live. And Yahweh, thy most high, will put all these curses on thine enemy, and on them that hate thee, which persecuted thee. And thou shalt return and obey the voice of Yahweh, and do all his commandments which I command thee this day. And Yahweh, thy most high, will make thee plenteous in every work of thy hand, in the fruit of thy body, and in the fruit of thy cattle, and in the fruit of thy land, for good. For Yahweh will again rejoice over thee for good, as he rejoiced over thy father. Thou shalt hearken unto the voice of Yahweh, thy most high, to keep his commandments, his statutes, which are written in this book of the law. And if thou turn unto Yahweh, thy most high, with all thy heart, and with all thy soul. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 1 through 10. Last but not least, certainly, book of Revelation. Revelation, the 11th chapter, the 7th trumpet, the revelation of Messiah. The 7th trumpet of the book of Revelation's 7 trumpets, which is located in Revelation chapter 11, from verses 15 to 19. Revelation chapter 11, verses 15 to 19. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdom of our master and of his Messiah, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders, which sat before Yahweh on their seats, fell upon their faces and worshipped Yahweh, saying, We give thee thanks, O Yahweh al Shaddai, which art and was and art to come. Because thou hast taken to thee thy great power in his reign. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come. And the time of the dead, that they should be judged. And that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great. And shouldest destroy them, which destroy the earth. And the temple of Yahweh was opened in heaven. And there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. And there were lightning and voices and thundering and an earthquake and great hail. Praise the Most High Yah. Praise the Most High Yah. You notice there what we just read. It said, the nations were angry and thy wrath is come. So that the anger of the nations is going to connect or meet up with the anger of of Yah. They're both going to be brought to a fever pitch at the same time. The nations will be angry and Yah will be angry. <laughs> Guess who will win that fight? <laughs> Guess who will win that fight? So brothers and sisters, Yah's patience is wearing thin with the earth. And he's going to destroy this place and redo it. And in fact, of course, this is what we're talking about in Isaiah chapter 7. Because brothers and sisters, what he does to us and to our fathers in history, what he has done is a sampling of what he's going to do. Okay. And so the slavery, the punishment, the, the, the correction, the chastisement, he will give to the heathen. As he has given it to us. The only difference is. The problem that the heathen have. Is they are not his chosen people. You see brothers and sisters. Regardless of how harsh. And it has been harsh. The Most High has punished our fathers. He always leaves a remnant. Did you notice that? Regardless of what happens. Regardless of the situation. There's always a remnant. It might get to the point. As it, with Allah, where he thought he was the only one. He said, they, they killed your prophets and I'm only the only one left. And Most High said, no, I got 7,000 others beside you. And Elijah didn't know that. So the Most High is always going to have a remnant. And the reason is because his fulfillment of promise to Abraham is going to take place. He said, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless your children after you. And you're going to be a great nation. I'm going to make a kingdom of priests and a holy nation out of you. That's going to happen. 
It cannot happen if we are extinct, right? If, if we are wiped off the earth, that cannot happen. But so therefore, he's always going to have a remnant. Oh. And we talked about last night, as Jacob, who is surname, who is called now Israel, took him and the rest of the souls, the 69 other men and, and the rest of the souls into Egypt, they were a small number, a small number. But they grew so rapidly and so powerfully. And again, I want to take note also that we read uh, previously last week, if you recall. In fact, let's take a look at it again, just as we're starting here. In Exodus chapter 1. Exodus chapter 1. Exodus chapter 1. And this is after Jacob had passed, after all the original 12 sons had passed, and now their children are there, and their grandchildren are there in Egypt. And there arose a pharaoh, the Bible says, that knew not Joseph, right? So he was he didn't care about what Joseph had done to save the nation, right? So now let's look into this, and let's start at verse 8. Let's start at verse 8. And I'm going to read from verse 8, and we're going to read down to verse 22. Exodus chapter 1 from verse 8 to 22. And again, this is a parallel. A parallel. What does that mean? That means what you're seeing here as we're reading has been going on with Israelites ever since they've been scattered. Anytime we've been in our enemy's land or scattered into foreign lands from our homeland, this is always the case. Always the case. Okay? Even right now, it is still the case. Let's take a look. Now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. And he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply and they come to pass that when there falleth out any war, they join also unto our enemy and fight against them, and so get them up out of the land. Therefore, they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens, and they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Itham and Ramesses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew, and they were grieved because of the children of Israel. And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor, and they made their lives bitter with hard bondage in mortar and in brick and in all manner of service in the field. All their service wherein they were made to serve was with rigor. And the king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of the one was Shifra, and the name of the other Pua, and said, When ye do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew woman, and see them upon the stools, if it be a son, then ye shall kill him. But if it be a daughter, then she shall live. But the midwives feared Yah, and did not as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the men children alive. And the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said unto them, Why have ye done this thing and have saved the men children alive? And the midwives said unto Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not as the Egyptian women, for they are lively and are delivered ere the midwives come in unto them. Therefore, Yah dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and waxed very mighty. And it came to pass, because the midwives feared Yah, that he made them house. And Pharaoh charged all his people, saying, Every son that is born, ye shall cast into the river, and every daughter ye shall save alive. Same thing is happening, brothers and sisters. It's been happening a long time, literally thousands of years. Anytime we've been, matter of fact, when you read the Apocrypha and the Maccabees, it shows they afflicted the children of Israel, and then the two nations, the two kings that were fighting against Jesus, the king of the south in Ptolemy and the king of the north in, in uh, Dem Dem Demetrius, they were fighting with each other and they were both trying to bribe the children of Israel who they had afflicted to help them. That same thing happened again during the Civil War and during the Revolutionary War. During the Revolutionary War, the British were talking up to the black people about helping them defeat the colonists. And the black people worked with the colonists. Then also... During the Civil War, the North was promising the black people freedom in order to help them beat the South. Not that they cared. And then after the war was over, what happened? Back to rigor. Back to hard bondage. And brothers and sisters, notice what Pharaoh said. He said, 
we got to deal with them because if, if enemies come in our land, they're going to fight with, with, against us with the enemy because that's how they treated them. Brothers and sisters, let me tell you, during this awakening that's going on right now as I'm speaking to you, many people, white, black, Chinese, many people are understanding that the wars that the United States are propagating and have been propagating for a long time are not wars of justice and righteousness. They're wars for profit, right? And so mostly they're aimed at poor people to induce poor people to join because they don't have nothing going on. They don't have any money. And so the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines say, join up with us. We'll feed you. We'll clothe you. And then you can help us win these wars for patriotism. And it's a lie. And people are catching on to it now. So that now, especially black people, part of this awakening is we understand that we don't want to serve these people in their armies, navies, air forces, and marines. And they're scared because if they get if they come in, if enemies come into this land, they're afraid we might fight with the enemy. They're afraid of that. And you know what? They're right. See? And so, brothers and sisters, matter of fact, during the 1960s, the Soviet Union used to show its citizens movie uh, video of how the Caucasian people lynched us. And how they sick dogs on us and beat us and burned us against trees. And they would say to their people, this is what capitalists do to their citizens. See, that's what they, they would say that. The Chinese probably did the same thing. This is what capitalists do to their citizens. See, so they always, we're always being used by the heathen between as they fight each other. And at the end of the day, though, brothers and sisters, just like it was in Exodus, when it's time for a deliverance, Yah destroys all of their stuff. And delivers his people, okay? And that same pattern exists now. So part of the situation in Isaiah is part of the spanking that we continually have to go through because not only uh, the reason we, we are afflicted, as Ezekiel also points out in Egypt, the reason our fathers were afflicted in Egypt was because they started worshiping Egyptian gods. They started forgetting who they were. Matter of fact, let's take a look at that. Ezekiel chapter 20. Ezekiel chapter 20. Ezekiel chapter 20. This stuff's not rocket science, brothers and sisters. It's all written very plainly in the word. We don't have to be in the dark about anything. We can know where, why we are here, who we are here, what the situation is, and where we're going. We can know it all. The Bible tells us everything. It doesn't leave anything out. All we have to do is study with the Father's Spirit, and he will guide us. And the way we should go, there's no question. He promises that in the very word we're talking about. Ezekiel chapter 20. Ezekiel chapter 20. And again, when we read this part of Ezekiel chapter 20, this is also a uh, formula or a, uh, a model of what true repentance needs to be. See? For all of the people, and I'm not talking about all Caucasians, because there's Caucasians that are Israelites. You say, what you talking about, brother? Caucasians of Israel. Well, I'll explain that in a minute. But Caucasians that become Israelites, generally, generally they're poor. And generally they've been chewed up by their own uh, people's system, right? Their own Caucasian Babylonian system that's created, chewed them up and spit them out. Isn't that correct? And so they end up coming to this truth. Also, can y'all hear me testing one, two, three? So they start to understand what it's like, you know, to be a Hebrew, <laughs> In this system. Okay. Let's go first. Ezekiel chapter 20. Ezekiel chapter 20. And let's begin at verse 1 of Ezekiel chapter 20. Uh, let's see. I'm going to read from verse 1 down to verse 7. To begin, Isha. From 1 to 7. Notice what it said. And it, it came to pass in the seventh year, in the fifth month, the tenth day of the month, that certain of the elders of Israel came to inquire of Yahweh and sat before me. Then came the word of Yahweh unto me, saying, Son of man, speak unto the elders of Israel and say unto them, Thus saith the Most High Yahweh. Are ye come to inquire of me? As I live, saith the Most High Yahweh, I will not be inquired of by you. Wilt thou judge them, son of man? Wilt thou judge them, cause them to know, watch this, the abominations of them? Nope. Cause them to know their abominations? Nope. Their children's abominations? Nope. It said cause them to know the abominations of their father. 
and say unto them, Thus saith the Most High Yahweh, in the day when I chose Israel and lifted up mine hand unto the seed of the house of Jacob and made myself known unto them in the land of Egypt, when I lifted up my hand unto them, saying, Ahiah, Yahweh, your Most High, in that day, in the day that I lifted up my hand unto them to bring them forth of the land of Egypt into a land that I had espied for them, flowing with milk and honey, which is the glory of all lands, then said I unto them, wait, he said, watch what he says now. Then said I unto them, cast ye away every man the abominations of his eye, and defile not yourselves with the idols of Egypt. Ahia, Yahweh, your most high. Now, wait, wait, wait. They were in Egypt long enough to start thinking they were Egyptians and start worshiping Egyptian God. And he told the elders, these are the elders, the, the most wisest of the people that came to him, that came to him inquiring of the prophet to see what the most high's mind was. And he said, I don't want to be a part of you. You need to repent of the sins of your father. You see, you got people today living nice, middle class people. And they said, I've never, I never whipped a slave. I've never owned a slave. I've never done anything to y'all. Make them to know the abominations of their fathers. That's, that's, you see what I'm testing one? Make them to know the abominations of their father. I will not be inquired of by you. He told the elders of Israel, much less the heathen. What the heathen, if the, if he's talking to his chosen people that way, what they think, <laughs> brothers and sisters, make them to know the abominations of their father. Then he said uh, about the Israelites, I tried to get you fathers out of Egypt and they worship an Egyptian God. They worship an Egyptian God. Okay, and it's that that caused them to be placed in slavery, brothers and sisters. Listen here. The church is the nation of Israel. The bride of the father and the, well, the bride of the Messiah is his chosen people. Testing one, two, three. You got me. He said, I have likened Israel unto a comely and delicate woman. That's his wife. He takes his vows very seriously. He's not having it. When you talk about committing adultery with other gods, he's not having it. And that's why I said, we read about it in Hosea, where he said, I'm going to pull you out into the wilderness. And I'm going to speak comfortably to you. I'm going to take you out from your house. I'm going to take you out from where, you, where you're from. And I'm going to teach you something. And that's what he did to our father. See, that's why we, whenever we get placed in slavery or in a bad way, that's what he's looking for. He's looking for repentance of our sins and the sins of our father. Caucasian people want to know how they're going to be saved? Same way we be saved. Except you coming through us. You coming through the Hebrew Messiah. You Caucasian. You coming through the Hebrew Messiah. You Chinese. You Japanese. You coming through the Hebrew Messiah. South Africa. You come through the Hebrew Messiah. And you repenting of your sins and the sins of your fathers. Just like we got. Only thing is. We are the chosen people. You not. You, you got to come correct. Make them to know the abominations of their fathers, what he told. Your father strung us up. Your father's chained us up. Your father set up a system where we're lower class. Your father's oppress us even now for wages. Your, your father's keep us down. Your father's stack pile us up, up in neighborhoods by block and then fill the area with drugs and guns for us to kill each other and be killed off. Your fathers have privatized prisons. And stack us up in there for long periods of time to make money off of our heads. Make them to know the abomination of their father. And they're all guilty. Listen, is there any man that's not guilty on the earth? I don't think so. They're all guilty. See, brothers and sisters, just like we are all guilty. We're born into this situation. You can't choose where you're born. But you can decide your destiny. You can decide. And the Most High is now showing. How can you decide? Know where you come from. Who are your people? What are the abominations? Because you all got some. Praise the Most High. Yeah. Now, I'm talking about the Gentiles real quick. Because I don't want them to think that they're getting left out. Converted Gentiles. My wife and I were just talking about this this morning. And I want to show you this scripture because, I mean, many people, you know, Christianity, they twist it. They twist it. They brainwash people and they twist the scriptures all up into knots and stuff. And they make it sound real complicated, right? They even make it dis disagree with each other. If you listen to Gentiles try to explain scripture, they'll be having scripture disagree with itself. You ever notice that? 
that we have in scripture disagree with itself. That's how confused they are. That's why it's called Babylon. You know what Babylon means, right? It comes from the from the root word Babel, Tower of Babel. Where what happened? They got confused. They got confused. You see, brothers and sisters, when you when you see, I'm gonna say some things. I want to make sure you can hear me. Testing one, two, three. You can hear me, right? But listen, listen here. The most dangerous people. Listen, I'm not even. I'm not even fronting with. The most dangerous people on planet Earth to Asatan are awakened Hebrew. They're the most dangerous. Because when they're awakened, what does it mean? It means they're repenting of their sin. And, and, and why are they dangerous? Because they're the only people on planet Earth that the true God has revealed himself to. The only people that he has chosen. They're the only ones. And he doesn't forget his promises. And he doesn't forget the promises to their ancestors. And he has promised to bring them back. And so an awakened Hebrew is the most dangerous person to Asatam. The most dangerous people to us. Listen carefully now. The most dangerous person on the planet Earth is the Caucasian male. Wherever he has gone, people die. I'm just being honest with you. He, he came over to these shores and he claimed to discover something that when people were, how can you discover something when people are already here, right? And every place he discovered, people died. And he took over. He did it in South Africa. He did it in the United States and North America. He did it in the Philippines. He did it in Australia. He do it wherever he go. He's the most dangerous man on the planet, the Caucasian man. Okay? The most dangerous. And, and but Asatan is controlling that. Now, Asatan's greatest fear is an awakened Hebrew. A Hebrew that knows who he is. They're even, have you noticed, they they got even Caucasian people and people don't know what they're talking about using the word woke. <laughs> you ever hear that? They they use the word woke. <laughs> it's like it's like when it's like when people with no rhythm try to dance. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> It's like people with no rhythm try to dance. People be like, yeah, just stop, man. Just stop. Just stop. Try to use the word woke. For those that might be listening, let me briefly explain what it means to be woke. Woke is shortened for awaken. Awaken means you were once sleeping and you just awakened from your sleep. That's what it means. And what it means really on its, on its original sense when it came out is, is black people awakening to who they are. That's what it is to be woke. It ain't got nothing to do with politics. It ain't got nothing to do with nothing else. To be woke means you are an awakening Hebrew. That's what it means. That means you were asleep. You didn't know who you was. You didn't know where you come from. All you knew is that you was in chains. You didn't even know what country in Africa you come from. People still trying to discover that stuff. But then all of a sudden, this present truth comes to your heart from the Father. And you start to realize who you are. And you start awakening. Well, that's what being woke is about. That's the original woke. Huh? That's the original woke. I'm just telling you. Now, let's look at Ephesians chapter 2. We get ready to go over there. Before we hit Isaiah hard on 7, I got to prepare y'all. So this here is for the converted Gentiles. It's important that the converted Gentiles understand. They want to understand their place in this thing. So let's take a look. Let's start at uh, Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to start at verse 11. And we're going to read from verse 11 down to verse 19. Okay, from 11 to 19. Watch this now. Watch carefully. Wherefore, remember, now Paul is the apostle to the heathen. So he's writing to the heathen. He's writing to the heathen Gentiles and he's writing to uh, people that were Israelites that have been mingling among Gentiles and became Hellenists, he's writing to these people who are now converted to the Messiah, the Hebrew Messiah. Watch what he says here. Wherefore, remember that ye, that is you Gentiles, being in time past, Gentiles in time past, in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision. So that was the name they gave to Gentiles among the believers. The, the believers called the Gentile believers Uncir the uncircumcision. Why? Because they were uncircumcised. 
by that which is called the circumcision. That was the Israelites because they were all circumcised in the flesh made by hand. Watch, verse 12, watch. That at that time, when you were uncircumcised Gentiles, at that time, you were without Messiah and what? You were being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. Wait, aliens from what? Aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. Are you catching that? This is what they were, okay? And strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without Yah in the world. So this is what they were before they met the Hebrew Messiah. They were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. He didn't say they were aliens from the church. They were aliens from the Christian church. He didn't say that. He said they were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. You need to catch that. What? But now, now, in Messiah, Yahweh, ye who were, who sometimes were far off, are made nigh by the blood of Messiah. So you were separated from the commonwealth, but you're being brought to the commonwealth. Are you catching me? Testing one, two, three. So you're being brought to the commonwealth because of Messiah, because he's the Hebrew, okay? He's bringing you in, okay? That's why you, the, the, the Israelites are saved by faith and the Gentiles through faith. He's bringing you in. But now in Messiah, Yahweh Shah, ye who sometimes were afar off are made nigh by the blood of Messiah. For he is our peace who hath made both one and hath broken down a middle wall partition between us. This is where the Gentiles, they just use these verses right here and they run with it, right? having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man and so making peace. So Gentiles are telling you, see, Gentiles and Jews are the same now. No, that's not the case. It, it, what has changed is the Gentile becoming Israelites through the Hebrew Messiah, that black man. They became Israelites through him. And he broke down, what ordinances did he break down? Many patients ask that. He broke down all the man-made rules created by scribes and Pharisees. That's what he hung on the cross. It had nothing to do with Yah's laws. This is what he hung on the cross. Man's law. You know, man's laws like Sunday keeping, you know, like eating pork, like man's law. He hanged that on the cross. Not his father's laws. Praise the most high. Let's continue. And that, that he might reconcile both unto Yah in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you, that is to you Gentiles, which were far off, and to them that were not. And through him, that is through the Hebrew Messiah, we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Good. Now therefore, watch verse 19. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens. With the saints in the household of Yah. So you were aliens from the commonwealth. But then through the Hebrew Messiah, you become what? A fellow citizen. A citizen of what? A citizen of the commonwealth of Israel. The scattered nation. Does that make sense, brothers and sisters? You see, how, if you read the whole thing in context, you catch that. But when you try to pluck and make a, you know, make a, what you call it? Like a, a buffet of the Bible and you just buffet in it. You know, you, you take one verse, you create a whole religion out of it. When they did that, they call it Christianity. But the brothers and sisters, this is telling us that the Gentiles that trust in the Hebrew Messiah become fellow citizens with the Israelites. Now, when you listen to the Christians talk, Christianity is one religion, and they got this other thing called, this other nasty thing called Judaism. That's another religion, right? They got two different religions. Following this scripture, them two religions should become one. When they try to make it one, they call them Abrahamic. But you see, them heathens that's calling themselves Jews, them heathens don't even believe in the Messiah. Them heathens don't even, they have a Kabbalah book of magic. And the Christians only believe in the New Testament. Okay? So how they how they gonna become one? <laughs> when white Jesus is, is, is worshipped by one and he don't even exist to the other. You know, then okay. No, what happens is the true Israelite people of Yah who are now awakening are bringing forth the message of the true Israelite Messiah. And that message has nothing to do with white Jesus or Christianity. And then Gentiles or Caucasians, whether they be Chinese or European or wherever they're from, 
when they hear this message, they say, you know, this is true. The spirit of the father touches a human heart. A human heart that wants truth will cause, will be touched by the spirit of the father. There's no question about it. Every human being that's sincere and wanting truth is going to be touched by the father. Now we can't judge. You and I never chose where we were born. We didn't choose our parents. We didn't choose who we were born into. We were just born. You understand? And we were born into a position. The most high born is there. A woman didn't decide, you know, before she came through her mother's womb to be a woman. And a man didn't decide before he came through his mother's womb to be a man. You were chosen to be that. And so you come into it. You're created that way. You might be created as the child of the descendant of slaves. You might have some of your relatives lynched. You didn't choose that. You were born into it. You might have come into a situation where you were born and your parents didn't want you and you were in foster homes or you were living in trailers or you living rough. You didn't choose that. It was brought unto you. The other day I was watching a video. It had nothing to do with religion. I was watching the dude and and while he was he was uh he was actually test driving a vehicle and he was talking about the vehicle but when he was riding by a certain house he saw sheriffs taking furniture out of a house and putting it on the front lawn and he said oh somebody's getting kicked out of their house he said people got to learn to manage their money that's what he said people got to learn to manage their money of course this was a Caucasian man talking about people got to learn to manage their money and I was so offended I didn't even, I just turned around I said look man first of all. That's an excuse that the, the people use when they want to appease their own content. It ain't about people mismanaging money. It's about people not having enough money, right? You understand? So if somebody's getting $8 an hour and they're trying to, and, and, then, and then you got two people, they're working two jobs to get 40 to 50 or 60 hours a week at $8 an hour and their rent is 1000 they're going to have struggle, especially if there's children involved. People got to eat. And most people don't make enough money. And then you're trying to work two jobs or three jobs to make ends meet. And you know, I mean, how, how long can you keep that up? That wears out the life forces. That's not what we're supposed to be doing. And so people that are pompous will look at that and say, we well, just need to manage your money. I mean, come on, man. But that's where we at. That's where we at right now. Okay. And now you got not only Hebrew suffering this. Matter of fact. The people that he saw getting kicked out their house was Caucasian people. And he still, he said, they need to manage their money. I said, wow. I mean, wow. And of course, he was from some podunk place down south where a lot of people don't make a lot of money. I mean, you know, there's just not a lot going on. There's some states in the United States, you don't move to these places unless you already got a job. You don't move there looking for a job because you're going to have trouble finding one. Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? You There's some places, like if you go to New York City, or you go to Washington, D.C., or you go to L.A. or Chicago, you can go there without a job in a lot of cases because you're going to pick up something. You're going to get something because there's a lot going on. But there's some other places, these little podunk cities, and they I'm not speaking against them because they podunk. I'm just saying don't go into them little places like you go into like Florida, some of them places in Florida, or you go to one of those little towns in Georgia or Alabama, or you, you go one of them places in Tennessee. Don't go down there if you don't have a job. You make sure you got a job before you come down if you go down there looking for a job, you're going to have a problem because there's hardly nothing going on. And people are struggling. People are struggling. Okay? But that's the reality. And now you're seeing this happen to the Gentiles as well. And so the people that are suffering of the Gentiles, they're the most, the most uh, 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 amenable, they're the most agreeable to receive this truth. The ones that are doing well, that ride by talking about you need to manage your money uh, better or you need to get and put yourself up by the bootstraps while they live in lives. Look, they're never going to come to this truth. They're never going to come to this truth. And the sad truth about it is a lot of them are in a corporatized culture and are just as much slaves as us. They just don't realize it because they got a roof over their head. They got food in their in the refrigerator and they're not worried about paying their bills. But they're still in the same slave system. They just don't realize it. it's a sad situation, really. Sad situation. But anyway, Gentiles become fellow citizens with the saints. The saints, brothers and sisters, are the Israelites of the nation of Israel. They're the people of the nation of Israel. They become fellow citizens with us. Praise the Most High. Yeah. Now, now that we got that out of the way, Let's go to Isaiah chapter 7 and let's see 
how our father is about to get spanked here. Isaiah, of course, as we mentioned last night, is the prophet in this particular sense. The Most High always raises up prophets from the Israelite to warn his people about what's getting ready to happen to them, good or bad. He tells them the situation. And if he's getting ready to spank them, he sends the prophets to say, listen, you guys headed the wrong way. This is not going to go well. And he tries to tell them, turn before it's too late. This is one of those situations here. And we talked about this last night, but let's start again. I, we got cut off, so we're going to start. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 1. Isaiah chapter 7. Let's see if this thing still works. I think it is. Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 1. And it came to pass in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, that Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Amalia, king of Israel, went up toward Jerusalem to war against it, but could not prevail against it. So now, let's go, you know, the Bible tells you, the Bible speaks in terms of not just you, but who are you the son of? <laughs> you know, it always does that. So-and-so, the son of so-and-so, the son of so-and-so. So here, Ahaz, that was the king of Judah. And Pekah was the king of Israel. And Rezin is the king of Syria. So you got three kings. Joth, uh, Ahaz, you got Pekah, and you got Rezin. Three kings. Rezin is the king of Syria, the only heathen. Pekah is the king of Israel, the northern kingdom. And Ahaz is the southern king of Judah. So Rezin and Pekah brought their countries together to fight against Judah. And that hurt Judah because they was brothers. But as we spoke about last night, there's a history between Ephraim and Judah. Not a good history. Ephraim was chosen to be blessed as Joseph's youngest son. The firstborn was Manasseh. But Jacob put the blessing of the firstborn on Ephraim. And Ephraim became the largest tribe and the richest tribe. And out of Ephraim came Joshua, the son of Nun, that led that Moses ordained to lead the children of Israel into the land of promise. And he settled in, in his own tribe's land, Ephraim, and he settled there in an area that's called Shiloh. And the Ark of the Covenant was with him there. Okay? But then as we, and I'm just going over this, forgive me if y'all heard it last night, but it wasn't on the video. But David came along and David, 400 years later, brought the ark from Shiloh to Jerusalem. And at that point, there was, there was beef between Ephraim and Judah. Now we saw last night, let's take a look first. Let's read this again. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 2. Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 2. Isaiah 7 and verse 2. And it was told the house of David, saying, Syria is confederate with Ephraim. And his heart was moved, and the heart of his people, as the trees of wood are moved with the wind. They was, they was, they was hurt when they heard that their brother joined forces with the heathen to fight against them. As they, as anybody would be, you might have, you know, we have beefs with our family often, right? I mean, right? I if somebody was to say you never had a fight in your family, either you haven't lived or something wrong with you or you just straight up lying. People have beef with their own bloodline. Happens all the time, especially between brothers, between uncles, brothers and sisters. We know this very well. I mean, every family has. It. So there's no difference. So you got beef between Ephraim and Judah. But Judah never expected Ephraim to go and get a stranger that's not in the family to fight against him. Never expected that, right? So he was hurt. But I also want to just point out, again, we talked about this last night, but I want to point it out again because it's worth going through. Isaiah chapter 11, which we're going to read in a couple of weeks, but I want to just point this out. Isaiah chapter 11, talking about the Hebrew Messiah and talking about Ephraim and Judah. Now, we know that Ephraim is going to get spanked, and we're going to read about it in a couple of minutes. And Judah later on was going to get spanked. About 700 years later, Judah got scared. Let's take a look, though. Let's take a look at the end result. 
Let's take a look at what Yah has ordained to happen. See, brothers and sisters, we praise the Most High Yah because when he speaks a word, there is nothing to stop it from coming to pass. It may not come to pass when people think it's going to happen, but when Yah speaks a word, it's going to happen. Not necessarily on our timetable, but it's going to happen on his timetable, okay? When he speaks a word, whether to bring something into existence or to take it out of existence or to make something happen or to prevent something, he speaks the word and it's going to come to pass. So let's take a look here. Isaiah chapter 11. I'm going to start at verse 10. And go down from verse 10 down to verse 13. Isaiah chapter 11 from verse 10 to verse 13. Question. Uh, is it skipping or is, is it is it pretty clear? You guys you guys listen, hearing it pretty clear or is it is it skipping or what? I mean, is, is everything all right out there? Yet last night it was, okay, good. Praise the most high. Yeah. Let's continue. And in that day, there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. Now, I want just to clarify something. The root is where a tree comes from, right? The root is, is what's planted, and then and the root goes down into the ground, and then the tree grows up. So Jesse is the, is the father of David. So this is saying the root of David, which he also calls himself in Revelation, the root of David has prevailed to open the book. Remember that? It said the root of David has prevailed to open the book. And then, of course, in Revelation later on, he says, Messiah says, I am the root and the offspring of David. Right. So he's not. That's amazing, isn't it? So he, David comes from him and he comes from David. That's amazing. So the root of Jesse, which is Messiah, he said. He shall stand for a sign of the people, an ensign, and to the and the Gentiles shall seek him. Now we saw that in Ephesians just now. The Gentiles, through the Messiah of the Hebrews that they seek, they become what? Become fellow citizens of the Commonwealth of Israel, according to what we just read in Ephesians chapter two, right? So the Gentiles through the Messiah become fellow citizens of the nation. They are not the original people of the nation, but as Paul tells us in Romans eleven. They are what? Grafted into the nation through faith. Okay. And it shall come to pass in that day. That is when the Gentiles seek the Hebrew Messiah. Somebody will say, well, there's people that are Christians all over the world. They love white Jesus. Let me ask you something. Is white Jesus the Hebrew Messiah? Testing. Is white Jesus the he No, he's not. <laughs> Of course he's not. So they're looking after a Jesus, but it's not the one that they're talking about here. Because he's not a Caucasian man with flowy blonde hair. And no, he didn't start no religion called Christianity. We already showed that in the scripture. He, all he did was come to seek and to save that which was lost. And he said, I came not but for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The Gentiles we just read in Ephesians, they become part of the nation through faith. Praise the most high, yeah. But it's not a Christianity. There's not a Judaism. There's just Yah, his chosen people, Israel, and the heathen that come into Israel through the Messiah. Praise the Most High Yah. And they shall come to pass in that day that Yahweh shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant. See, there's always a remnant. Recover the remnant of his people, which shall be left. Where they come from? Where they, where they, where they flee from? Where they scattered into? Assyria and from Egypt and from Pathro and from Cush, them all African places. Places that Ham had taken, Elam, Shinar, Hamath, and the islands of the sea where the Gentiles are. How we end up there? Deuteronomy 28, 68. I'm going to bring you into Egypt again by ship. Egypt not only being Mizraim of the, of the children of Ham, but Egypt also meaning house of bondage. I'm going to bring you to the house of bondage again, this time by ship. That's how you got to the islands of the sea. Okay? And he shall set up an ensign for the nation, for the heathen, and shall assemble also the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah, outcasts of Israel, northern kingdom, dispersed of Judah, southern kingdom, from the four corners of the earth. 
The envy also of Ephraim shall depart, and the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. Wait. The envy also of Ephraim shall depart. Did you see that? So there's no, no more envy between Ephraim and Judah. And no more adversaries to Judah, the people that hurt Judah. You see, brothers and sisters, the last kingdom to be scattered was Judah. Okay? Most of us here in the Americas come from Judah. I'm not saying we are the tribe of Judah. I'm saying we are from the southern kingdom of Judah. You're, that's the difference. There are different people, like there were Levites and Benjamin and, and, and others that dwelt in the land of Judah. All of us come from this. Most of us that came into slavery came through Africa from our fleeing from the Romans and from before that, the Greeks and before that, the, the Medes and the Persians and before that, the Babylonians. We came through Africa, was now called Africa. It wasn't called Africa then. It was called Cush and Mizraim and Ham. It was Hamite land. And so we came through that land and then we got placed into slavery from the sons of Yafet. Right? And most of that people came from the southern kingdom of Judah. Not all, but most. Okay? So he said, I'm going to gather together the outcasts of Israel and the dispersed of Judah. The envy also of Ephraim shall depart and the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Judah and Judah shall not vex Ephraim. Praise the Most High Yah. So he's planning on restoring the people. Now, somebody said, well, how are you going to do that? The last 10 lost tribes and the Israelites from the southern kingdom been scattered all over there. How are you going to do that? Let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. We're talking about a God that has created all the stars and has each star its own name. Okay? We're talking about a God that the Bible told us his understanding is infinite. So we're talking about a God that, can raise, that, that created Adam from dust. Right? Did he not? He created a man from dust. Can he not recreate a man from dust? Can he not call a man from dust? Does he not even know every particle that made up that man and can put it together when he wants to just by speaking it? Yes, he can. So when he, when we read Ezekiel 37 and he talks about the valley of dry bones and he talks about blowing his spirit on it and raising up an army, brothers and sisters, we are already witnessing that. We're already witnessing that. In fact, let's take, right? How You say, well, how are we witnessing that? The awakening of who we are. Remembering that we are the true Hebrew is, is the blowing of the Father's Spirit upon us, causing us to awaken. Talk about being woke. That's the original woke right there. That's the original woke. They always take what we do and try to copy it. You notice that? You know, the Most High gave us the originality. He gave us the creativity. And we, we, we create something and they try to copy it, man. Just the same way like Japanese try to copy German cars, man. It's the same thing. It's amazing. But anyway, that's how it works. So now he's going to bring back Ephraim. He's going to bring back Judah. He's going to make one nation. Again, let me read one more scripture. Let's, let's read one more because I just like to read this one. It's Ezekiel chapter 37. I just like to read this one. Ezekiel 37. Yeah, they tried to mess us up last night, but it's all good. It's all good. Ezekiel 37. This is after the Valley of the Dry Bones in that chapter. Okay, I'm going to start at verse 13. And I'm going to read from verse 13 of Ezekiel 37. I'm going to read the rest of this chapter, but I'm going to read, I'm going to first, I'm going to start from verse 13. Down to verse, let's see, down to verse 20, from verse 13 down to verse 20. And ye shall know that Ahia Yahweh, when ye shall know Ahia Yahweh, when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves, and shall put my spirit, see, I shall put my spirit in you, and ye shall live, and I shall place you in your own land. Then shall ye know that I, Yahweh, have spoken it. And performed it, says Yahweh. And the word of Yahweh came again unto me, saying, Moreover, thou son of man, take thee one stick, and write upon it for Judah, and for the children of Israel his companion. Then take another stick, and write upon it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel his companion. 
and join them to another, join them one to another into one stick. They shall become one in thine hand. And when the children of thy people shall speak unto thee, saying, Wilt thou not show us what thou meanest by these? Say unto them, Thus saith the Most High Yahweh. Behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim and the tribes of Israel, his fellows, his fellows, and put will put them with him, even with the stick of Judah, and make them one stick, and they shall be one in my hand. And the sticks whereon thou writest shall be in thy hand before their eyes. Huh? He's bringing back Judah and Ephraim, the two leaders of the nation. Again, let's go from verse 21. Let's go from verse 21 down to verse 28. From verse 21 down to verse 28. And say unto them, Thus saith the Most High Yahweh, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whether they be gone, and will gather them on every side and bring them into their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land upon which upon the mountains of Israel. And one king shall be king to them all, and they shall be no more two nations. Neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all. Neither shall they defile themselves any more with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions. But I will save them out of all their dwelling places wherein they have sinned, and will cleanse them. So shall they be my people, and I will be their most high. And David, my servant, shall be king over them. And they all shall have one shepherd. They shall also walk in my judgment, observe my statutes, and do them. And they shall dwell in the land that I have given unto Jacob, my servant, wherein your fathers have dwelt. And they shall dwell therein, even they and their children and their children's children forever. And my servant David shall be their prince forever. And I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will place them and multiply them and will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. My tabernacle also will be with, shall be with them. Yea, I will be their most high. They shall be my people. And the heathen shall know that I, Yahweh, do sanctify Israel. And my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them forevermore. Praise the most high. Yahweh. See, brothers and sisters. So that's what's coming. So whatever we read about now in Isaiah 7, you can understand it's coming from ugly. It's coming from ugly. Well, brothers and sisters, you know, my wife and I were talking about this this morning. And she said, man, that's a sad history. It's a sad history. What we read here in Isaiah. And I said, no, it's a good history. Brothers and sisters, don't despise your history. It's your history that makes you where you are now. See, the end result of our history is going to be everlasting righteousness. That's the end result. And we wouldn't have got there if it wasn't for where we come from. Testing one, two, three. I know it's been harsh. Don't ever despise where you come from, brothers and sisters. You might have done some dumb things. All of us done dumb things. All of us made mistakes, brothers and sisters. Don't despise the past. Learn from the past. Because it's part of your past that made you stand where you are right now. Praise the Most High. Yeah. Let's continue. Isaiah chapter 7. Isaiah chapter 7. Let's start at verse 3. Let's start at verse 3 and go down to verse 8. From verse 3 to 8, Isaiah chapter 7, from 3 to 8. Then said Yahweh unto Isaiah, Go forth now to meet Ahaz. See, Ahaz is the king of Judah. Thou and Sha'ir Jashub, Sha'ir Jashub, thy son, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool in the highway of the fullest field. So he's telling Isaiah, go meet the king with your, and take your son with you. Go meet the king and take your son with you. Okay? And, they, and say unto him, take heed and be quiet. Fear not, neither be faint-hearted. For the two tails of these smoking firebrands, for their fierce anger of Re, uh, for the fierce anger of Rezin of Syria and the son of Ramalia. See, the son of Ramalia is Pekah. And then Rezin is the king of Syria. So he said, don't worry about these two fools. We're going to fix them. He said, don't worry about that. Because Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Ramalia have taken evil counsel against thee, saying, let us go up against Judah and vex it, and let us make a breach therein for us, and set a king in the midst of it, even the son of Tabaiah. Excuse me, Tabaah. Thus saith the Most High Yahweh, it shall come, it shall not stand, 
neither shall it come to pass. For the head of Samaria of Syria is Damascus, and head of Damascus is resident. Within three score and five years shall Ephraim be broken that it be not a people. So he's going to destroy Ephraim completely. Again, that's what he has to do when we go too far. When he's been trying to tell us to turn, especially when we're the chosen people, he has to break us down, all the way down. All the way down. And then build us back up. It starts with, with us being spanked and then coming to repentance. That's the way it happens, brother and sister. We get spanked and then we come to repentance. So he said, if I'm not even going to be a people, it's going to be scattered. Okay? In 65 years, from the time he told them that, it's going to be scattered, going to be destroyed. And why would he protect Judah? Because he's promised to David, his promise to Abraham, his promise to Isaac. He's protect Judah, right? For his servant David's sake. Brothers and sisters, again, I just want to stress, when the Most High leaves us, there's no human hand that can really stop what he's ordained to come upon us. We were ordained to go into slavery. He said, you will have no strength to stand against your enemies. And even in South Africa, where they outnumbered the Dutch, they still were brought under the yoke of the Dutch. Right? That's the way it works. Even though they outnumbered them. Okay? So when he's not with us, it doesn't matter how many numbers we have, it's not going to work. But when he's with us, it also doesn't matter if we're outnumbered. See? Gideon. Right? It also doesn't matter if we're outnumbered. When he's with us, nothing can stop. Okay? When he's with us, nothing can stop. It works both ways. Okay? So here, he's protecting Judah. Judah was going to be able to defeat Syria and the northern kingdom, regardless of how many men they brought, because the Most High was going to be with him for his servant David's sake. Okay? So he said, Ephraim is going to be broken that it be not a people. And that's what happened. The Assyrians later came. And Ephraim was scattered. The northern kingdom was scattered to the point where nowadays they call them the ten lost tribes. They call them the ten lost tribes because they've been scattered for, for many, many, many centuries. In fact, they've been scattered for millennia, from, for several millennia. Okay? But we just read in Isaiah where, and in Ezekiel where he said, I'm bringing them back together at the end. I'm bringing them back together. I'm raising them up out their graves. I'm bringing them from places they have been scattered and I'm bringing them back together. He said that. Okay? Let's continue. Isaiah chapter 7. I'm going to read from verse 9. I'm going to read from verse 9. Isaiah 7 from 9 to 14. Moreover, Yahweh spake again unto Ahaz, saying, Ask thee a sign of Yahweh thy most high. So he's telling Isaiah is speaking to the king of Judah. He says, Ask for a sign that these things are going to come to pass. And, 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 and he said, ask it either in the depth or in the height above. And Ahaz, as the king said, Ahaz said, I will not ask, neither will I tempt your house. And he said, hear ye now, O house of David. Is it a small thing to you to weary men? But will ye weary my God also? Therefore, Yahweh himself shall give you a son. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now, let's stop right here. Of course. We know this is also, not only did this happen at that time, but it also happened in the New Testament. It was a prophecy of Messiah. This man, Emmanuel, that was born at that time was a sign that the Most High was going to be with his people. That's why he called him Emmanuel, meaning Yah with us, because he was going to be with the people. He said, the baby's going to be a sign. Even though you're going to go through some stuff, the baby's going to be a sign. He said, a virgin shall conceive, a young woman. A young woman shall conceive. That's what that means. Now, most people take that to mean they go, they run off with it half cocked talking about Joseph's the father. No, Joseph is not the father. When Miriam herself said, I know not a man. And not only that, when Joseph said, I don't want to make her a public example, so I'm going to divorce her private. Public example because she was found pregnant before Joseph had. Vowed. There's no wedding ceremony in the Bible. There's a feast, a wedding feast. And the certain and what makes the two people married is when the man goes in to the woman. That's and, and, and even today they call it consummating the marriage. That's what they call it today. Consummating the marriage. So when the man goes into and becomes one flesh with that woman, that's her husband. In the Bible, a woman can only have one husband. 
Now, in the Bible, we know very well, men can have more than one wife. Happened many, 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 many times in the Bible. Again, we pointed out last night, although all things are lawful, not all things are expedient. The way the society is right now, the way women have been raised, the way men have been raised, first of all, most of these brothers can't afford one wife, much less two. And second of all, second of all, many of these sisters have been raised in a culture where that's my man. It ain't nobody else's man but mine. You can't just change that overnight. Okay? Now, some brothers and sisters have done it, right? They still, you see some brothers with two wives. Okay. The Bible says you have a wife, you could take care of a wife, you take, and it says two. Some brother, I seen one brother with four. That's crazy. But anyway, if you have a wife, you could take care of her, and she and they're all amenable to doing that. That's your business. It's, 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 I can't speak against it because the Bible speaks for it. But again, that doesn't mean we should do it. I would not recommend it in this day and age because you know you're gonna cause all kinds of trouble. Sisters don't 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 take that too well. Yeah, sisters don't take that too well. They just it's just. And brothers don't even handle it right. They think it's all about a sex thing. You know, they dreaming about menage a trois and all that. Instead of trying to take care of a sister as a wife, you understand? They don't even un understand what it is. And especially these young brothers trying to do it. All they doing is trying to get, you know, trying to get their rocks off. That's all they doing. They're not trying to take care of nobody. Anyway, I wouldn't recommend it. But it was common in the Bible times. Very common. So let's take a look. I, so now, uh, so Mary had Messiah, that was the same as this prophecy, although this prophecy also talked about a local young woman that was going to get pregnant by Isaiah, and that they called him Emmanuel because he represented the Most High being with the children of Israel at this time. Okay? And again, that's how prophecy works sometimes. That's why we can see stuff written in Jeremiah about Babylon, and we can apply it to what the spirit of, of Revelation calls Babylon, which is the modern society in which we're in led by the Christian church. The modern society which we're in, led by the Christian church, which is led out of Rome. And you can apply those things, because that's how the Bible does it, just like it did here. Okay? Isaiah chapter 7, let's go from verse 15. Let's read from verse 15. Hmm. Uh, I want to read verse 15 and 16. Uh, actually, 15, 16, and 17. 15, 16, and 17. Butter and honey shall he eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that thou abhorrest shall be forsaken of both her kings. Yahweh shall bring upon thee and upon thy people and upon thy father's house days that have not come from the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, even the king of Assyria. So he's telling the king of Judah, that is Isaiah is telling the king of Judah, both Rezin and Pekah are going to be destroyed before this child is even grown to be weaned. After this child is weaned, before it becomes 12 years old, they're going to be destroyed. And it says within 65 years, Ephraim's going to not even be a people. And brothers and sisters, it's amazing, as we pointed out last night, Messiah was also conceived. He was also called Emmanuel, Yah with us, because he is representative of Yah with the children of Israel also. And also about, let's say, 70 years after he, after he uh, was born, 65 years, let's say, after he was weaned, Jerusalem was destroyed. Jerusalem was destroyed. Isn't that something? So he was also a sign, and Judah rebelled, and in AD 70, they was destroyed. Just like here. 65 years later, Ephraim, like it doesn't be a people. And so when, when Jerusalem was destroyed in AD 70, the Israelites were scattered all over the earth. And there was millions of Israelite people taken as slaves, and tens of thousands of them uh, crucified on crosses, hung up on trees. And as a matter of fact, all the way to the 20th century, we still getting hung up on tree. Isn't that correct? Am I lying to you? Uh, all, all the way to the 20th century, we still getting hung up on trees. You think that's coincidence? Messiah got hung up on a tree. Israelites by the Romans got hung up on a tree, and still our brothers get hung up on trees. Praise the Most High. You know, we we you know we can see what's happening. All we gotta do is read it. It's right there in the scriptures. All we gotta do is believe it. Remember what he said there? We just read. He said. 
He said, uh, if ye will not believe, surely ye shall not be established. That's what he said. If you will not believe, surely you will not be established. Praise the Most High God. We're going to pause right here before we continue in chapter 7 and go into chapter 8 as well. Let's have a pause. I'm going to stop right here. Let me turn off this thing here. Hopefully it recorded. And then we're going to...